my rehearsal sessions are awful sometimes. I mean, we'll have a fight like, well, how are we going to play this and what way are we going to do it? I want to use this kind of harmony. I want to use that. You go to hell. I'm not using that. Oh, no, I'm going to use this. I want to do this way. And we start rehearsing it. And the percussionist who wants to do it his way anyway goes on. He said, what are you doing? You know, and like, you know, we just scream and holler. And, and like a lot of pieces we performed last time, last night, two of the pieces that started, uh, that we played from the bottom to the top, originally they started in the middle. One started at the top, you know, took two or three months of fighting and working things out to get this joint, because it's got to be this sort of joint agreement. When you play it by yourself, it's one thing, but you got these other minds, and since you do not have a specific notation worked out, it's rather, well, that red means it's nice and, you know, that's soft and delicate to me. And, my, and the saxophone, I mean, his ankle says, no, it isn't. I mean, that's rough and scratch like doing that. And I said, well, no, I don't think so. I mean, that's a little softer than you think. I mean, because that really isn't that contrasty. That's not compliments. I mean, that's analogous color. And he says, well, I don't know what analogous color is. That's raspy to me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he goes, so we do this thing. So you got to go on and on because I can't play one way and he plays another way. And another thing, it's got to be this unified thing. So you all agree that at the end, or when it gets to a certain point, does everybody agree that that's, that's it? Well, I mean, you know? we, shall we say, we compromise to the point that we tolerate each other to perform it that way. <laughs> and that's literally what happens to the next shout out. Have you thought of collaborating visually? Uh, have I thought about collaborating? Uh, I guess I just want to give you a little bit of a background in that uh, I mentioned last evening at this concert that it's all sort of started here and that I was a student, uh, I think like most of you are, like most of your graduate students, is that correct, uh, in the MFA program, right? And so was I. I was in printmaking. And, uh, but I hung out with the musicians. And... Um, that sort of happened inadvertently. Uh, I was a graduate teaching assistant, and I had to, uh, you know, I was teaching a drawing class, and it was getting boring putting them stupid setups and stuff. So I got a nude string quartet, and it caused a little bit of a stir. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but I got to know some people in the music department, mostly people in composition, a fellow named Dave Keckley, and uh, who's the son of a professor Keckley in the music department. And uh, they would discuss music composition, and I'd be discussing, you know, painting composition. And we started paying attention to how the we're using the same terminology. Like they would tell a, someone working a piece of music and say, well, you know, this doesn't sound right. You need a little more space in this area. Or your transition's not working out right. Uh, you need a little more color. Um, and uh, I used to just close my eyes and say, are you guys talking about painting or are you talking about music, you know? And I started realizing this correspondence between the two. So at that point in my life, I'd gone through the cooning things and was very heavy into Cezanne. But it was, um, I just, at a certain point, something happened. And I started what I call looking at music to understand what I now term structure. And I have to be honest with you and say that a lot has occurred over a lot of years, and I've developed a terminology. visual correlation um, was one in which I assume space to me eventually ended up being a manifestation of time, not creating actual time, in the sense that you can all look at your fingers at an instant, just look down at your hands, but you can look back through the door or look out the door in front. The fact that you know that that's 20 steps or 30 steps or 10 yards, it feels further away in time because, of course, we are the center of the universe and we measure everything according to ourselves. And um, so that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And then it was the little things like, uh, maybe it wasn't so important in music, uh, the fact that I was hearing notes and specific notes, but maybe the intervals between the notes. 
that without the intervals, I couldn't be aware of the time. Correspondingly, um, we could empty out this huge studio here. If we took everything out, we'd only be aware of so much space. But the moment we put people, objects, things that we know in, we can, the space is clarified. So for me, notes clarified time the same way as objects clarified space. And that little bit of thing there took about six to nine months to get into, right? All kinds of ways. I mean, That's how it began. And uh, at first, I was uh, you know, listening to, just listening to a lot of music. In the beginning, attempting to interpret, actually do a visual interpretation of a piece of music. One was a piece I did called Six Bagatelles when I was a student here, because it was a big uh, new music festival here in my first year here. And, um, but then I start realizing I didn't want to interpret. What I want to do was understand the principles because by understanding the principles, I would understand what I call structure, which has nothing to do with the specific media, but has, shall we say, I guess the easiest way would be, in the media term, would be to design events, whether they're visual events, audio events, uh, literary events, but the, the designing, ordering, structuring of events so that one can present some sort of intelligent point of view. And, uh, and I felt that basically this underlying structure was in almost every creative endeavor. So uh, whether I read The Wasteland or um, whether or not I was listening to Bartok or to Aretha Franklin or looking at Kandinsky or looking at a, um, or looking at a Toulouse-Lautrec, there was something underlying all of these things that were very similar. And that's what I wanted to get at. So I started what I call my looking at music and listening to painting. And that's how it sort of generally started. And then, you know, I went through all kinds of things with my work, going back and forth from, you know, being interested in uh, dealing first with the space by putting first, you know, just marks to show the kind of activity then Marx took on a three-dimensional form, dealing with light and certain things about color, and then eventually dealing with some, dealing with um, poems, taking cues from like from poems, which I did a group of things called visual poems, and then eventually going into um, going into making scores, or what I call structures for performance. That's basically how it all. Uh, started and like right now, what I do is my my work on paper usually has a lot to do with sound, the ideas about sound, and um, certain concepts and ideas about the sound start dictating a particular format. Uh, whether or not each piece is performed or not becomes irrelevant. But without the idea of doing a particular kind of music or this or uh, the feeling that I want from some sound, it wouldn't happen. Now, whether or not it's performed exactly like I want or, uh, you know, to me it becomes irrelevant. The main thing is that my work just has to be about something. My acrylic paintings are, in a sense, they're dance scores. Okay, you guys are ready? All right, a little bit of energy, not too fast. And uh, before all of that happened, I was a closet pianist. In other words, like uh, for in 1968, I had my first piano, which was, uh, you know, uh, you pick it up, and uh, if you pay for getting it out, it's yours. I had one of those. 
and within three months, half the keys were broken and frozen, ivory flying everywhere because all this pent up <laughs> kinds of things. And what I was doing in those days was making what I called audio prints because at that point I was only making prints. And I would sit down to the piano and say, instead of having color, or like an etching or an aqua tint, or you know, or a wash area, um, I had 88 keys. Instead of having a big one or a small one, I had three seconds, three minutes, or 30 minutes. And I would sit down and try to structure an order at a time. And just by projecting sounds. It didn't matter to me, well, I was always interested in what one terms uh, atonal music anyway, so uh, therefore I didn't have to go out and develop all this chord harmony structure. I would just do things. In fact, the weirder the better, because that way it wasn't aligned. It wasn't aligned with the tune. You weren't interested in the note, but you become more aware of the, di the dynamics of what was occurring, and that's what I was interested in. Well, within six months, I was even working paintings out on the piano, where I would get into a problem. I would start playing the painting to work it out. Like, for example, I would have, like, maybe, for example, if there was something like this, I'd be playing it fast or doing, and I would say some kind of balance thing. I'd work out a transference system that I could work it out on. Now, um, then eventually I kept playing, and I went to Rome, because I was teaching at the Temple University Tower School in Rome, and I met a fellow named Steve West from the British Academy, and he was, I thought I was insane, but he was truly insane. And he... Uh, I mean, he played uh, saxophone, and uh, he just kept encouraging me to, like, we should do it, we should do it, we should do it. So finally, we did start, uh, you know, working on pieces, and we got another musician. And in six months, we did, you know, my first concert, which for me was like a shock, because, like, hey, you know, like, I'm a visual artist. I hang out in the studio. I mean, to get up there in front of people, be cool. No, leave me alone. You know, I don't want to do that. And, uh, but then once I found I did it, I found I was a ham. I loved it. <laughs> and I haven't stopped since then, you know. What I want to do, what I have here is I have some watercolors, and I just want to show, uh, for me, the interest in sound keeps a sort of freshness and openness and varies, you know, the approach I use on working on various pieces. Um, for example, just a, um, this is a piece based on an idea for uh, percussion. Some of you were here last night, saw my percussionist. He had a third of his usual hardware with him. You know, you add gongs and more tinkles and things like that. And of course, I want to utilize all of that. So I come up with this kind of structure to sort of uh, maybe idea about certain kinds of rhythms, certain kinds of uh, uh, um, activity in, uh, that I think that he could utilize in order to work. And it's an idea in my head. Of course, he hates this piece with a passion, won't touch it, right? But that's irrelevant. Without the idea of being, um, you know, percussion piece, I wouldn't do it, okay? I'm also, I'm interested in ideas also that, you know, uh, that are very quiet, very delicate, and um, almost sometimes what I would call, I like playing around with the idea of boredom. It's something so simple, so delicate, but you've got to be, take a real, you know, uh, concentration to see what's going on. So I come up with a piece like this. It's very quiet, open, little, you know. It'd be like a... And most people look at me, that cat is nut, putting him away. All right, but still, just doing that, I can come up with, you know, some sort of organization like this which I'm interested in because I've created two pieces that are totally different. Well, normally as I'm working on, like if I said working on space or working on color thing, you keep hammering back on the same thing a lot. And I like being able to sort of like stretch and extend my sensibilities over, you know, a, a, a vaster range. And don't run out of string so fast. Yeah, right. <laughs> Because, uh, because the thing was that we did the, uh, I was noticing the thing. We were into the Concord before one minute. Okay? That's a little too fast. Alright, let's go. Here yeah, we did that piece? Yeah. This is rehearsal. I have this thing about dealing with, uh, I like ideas like very standard things, like a voice quartet. Well, how does one deal with a voice quartet? One is simultaneously singing, how can you control that? So I came up with like my fake staff thing here, which is horizontal lines moving. 
And um, so with that kind of idea of a voice quartet and some kinds of things, a unison that I wanted to do, I came up with a drawing like this. Now, if I hadn't thought of a thing with a quartet, it just wouldn't have come out that way. Now, the fact whether it could be a string quartet or four people or thing, yes, it can or cannot. But it helped me pick, uh, you know, work it out. I don't know if it's really available, but I did a, there's some pieces I did based on the ideas of a round. And most of you know what a round, uh, a visual round is? Uh, is it anything like a cannon? Right, exactly a cannon. Now, I got about two or three others down here someplace. Uh, this is an idea, one of the ideas of a round, where the idea where one would start and proceed in a direction, and then someone else starts and proceeds in the same direction as thing. So it's like a, a row, row, row your boat kind of thing. And with the idea being to pick the pieces so that there, you have enough contrast and sounds and things to go over and it would function and work. Well, that's enough to make me make a drawing. The idea of a round. Whether they ever performed as a round, whether it would work as a round, it'd be irrelevant. Uh, as a matter of fact, one is working as a round. We haven't gotten it worked out well enough for a concert yet, but we have been working the thing with a round. And, uh, and to me, that's the function of it. It keeps things vital, it keeps things changing. I get excited, and that's what I want to do, you know. I don't want to, you know, become too old a man too quickly, so I got to keep things jumping around, you know. So. Most people will need. Drawings to other people's music? Mm, no, it went in the very beginning I started doing some things. Like I said, I did a couple of pieces that were based on people's music, and uh, I stopped doing that because uh, I felt that I was illustrating something else. I wasn't really creating something. And before that, even when I was in, when I was an undergraduate, you know, uh, at that time, this is like the early 60s, it was a very very positive, strong in this country, black movement kind of thing. And people were telling me to, to relate to that. And my way of relating to that was uh, relating to music, because that's what I responded to. That's why I identified with more was, with was black music. And so uh, I uh, used to do paintings of Miles Davis and Moody, you know, dark, uh, you know, landscapes, like on top of Mount Rainier, playing this horn and stuff. And, it just, but it wasn't music. And I started realizing I wanted to make music. 
So I just stopped, you know, illustration just didn't, it just wasn't the thing. But I stayed with the music, you know, and expanded it and a lot of stuff. I think in contemporary work, I think it's interesting how uh, the artist uses his subject matter. And it's a topic that we that talk about a lot. It's that uh, subject matter or content could be all number of things. It depends on one's intent and how one one's awareness, one desire for. Uh, and your intent seems to be to keep things changing. Oh yeah. So um, it isn't as if you want to convey a meaning. Uh, Although that maybe, maybe you'd no, think that'd be no, nice. No, 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 yeah, well, I got a thing way back. <laughs> the reason I went through music instead of going to literature, you know, is that every now and then I hear something, I go, ugh. You know, the feeling like you get that guttural response sort of thing. If people say, well, what do you want? What do you want to convey? Every now and then I'll put something, somebody goes, woo! And I say, hey, I did it. <laughs> That's what it's all about, communication. And in terms of whether or not, in terms of communicating a specific message, or communicating a, uh, maybe a political thing or something like that, no, I'm not that interested in that. I'm interested in coming up with a stimulus that might provide you with an interesting experience to make you see some kind of relationship or something that you maybe weren't aware of before. But uh, that would definitely make you feel good that you're alive. And, uh, but to me, in order to do that, it really has to be about something, for me, personally. And uh, a lot of times, you know, it vacillates back and forth between technical things and non-technical things. And by that, I mean technically visual things, playing with space, to me, it's like playing with positive and negative forms, which is a thing I've been trying to work out with my musicians we haven't really worked out yet, is that, you know, making a negative. There's technical ways of doing it, but you don't really hear it. You know, there's things of doing with certain kinds of harmonies that you can make it 
actually, you know, uh, the symmetrical, non-symmetrical kinds of things, configurations, mm -hmm. but it still doesn't, doesn't come through. But the things that interest me, you know, visually that I play back and forth with, that, you know, become a part of a whole other context. So I don't rule one thing out over one or the other. Everything becomes a part of this vast thing as the usual questions and people say, I mean, are you a composer? Are you a musician? Are you a painter? Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, just what are you? I said, well, all of those, you know. And maybe a sculptor too, if somebody give me some money to do what I want to do. You know, I won't dance. I'll have some people dance. I, I really know, you know. My dancing days went out <laughs> on that one. one point I was trained, you know, I was trained in the Tamron Lithographic Workshop. Uh, uh, so I'm a trained lithographic printer where I'm trained to work in collaboration with people. But that's sort of like on a technical thing. Like I'm a technical extension of their ideas. I don't do the actual drawing, but the drawing can't be realized without me. Okay. Uh, I haven't ever worked in a situation other than the music where uh, I've worked, uh, you know, um, I've worked with someone actual creating or what I call actual drawing things. Because a lot of things that, I think in working with collaboration and things, you've got to be able to, a certain kind of communication level and a certain kind of timing thing, which for me can work on, uh, uh, in the sound, but I, I don't, knowing the way I work visually, like I'll get the idea about doing a thing and I'll just start working. And if at any certain point you scream at me and ask me, like, if I'm making this line down here, what was I'm doing? I can't tell you what I'm doing. There's a hurting certain kind of thing that's going on. I can't communicate it at all. It just happens. All the study, all the understanding, it's all done before, and it's a very intuitive kind of thing. Happens. And uh, I think if I was to be doing it in collaboration, it would have to come more out of that intuitive thing and more into a, a matter of fact of knowing exactly at the split second what's going on so I can direct someone else to let them know what's going on to make it happen. And that happens with the music. We're doing things and we have to start talking and explaining, going back and going, you know, going on. And I don't know whether or not I could do that, um, you know, working on the visual thing. Maybe it's, you know, it's, I, you know, I admit I'm one to like tradition and stuff like that in the way that I came about, so, you know. Anyway, let me put up some more. I have a question regarding your performance last night and timing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, you all appear to be reading your paintings last night. Oh, yeah. More than looking at each other, it seemed to me, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Since you don't have a system of notation, I was mm -hmm. wondering, how it was that you decide that you're done with this part and on to that part now, and how you come about with how long it takes you to go down that line all together. Like, I you just feel it. You rehearse. We have a lot of rehearsal time. A lot of rehearsal time. In fact, they hate me. 
So then do you argue about how long it takes oh, long yeah. to get them? Uh -huh. And do you have some sort of group beat going on that the audience is not it's aware of? It's built in. I can't explain it. It's just built in. Just it practice. Really is. Hmm? Just practice. Practice. For example, like we do a thing like this. This is so much bigger than this here. It's got to be so much longer than that. You just got. You I mean you start building? A, you're building your sense of timing. And that's why. I mean, I was telling at lunch today. I was mentioning that you know sometimes we have a piece that we'll play for ten minutes in rehearsal. Ten minutes, and we get on and do it in the concert. All of a sudden, it hit the seven minutes. Sometimes it goes to 14 minutes. Depends on whose adrenaline is kicking who off. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, by rehearsing a lot, you get to, you do certain, you don't play it identically the same, but there's certain ways, limited ways, which you realize certain things. I can tell when somebody's someplace. I can tell when someone's playing that blue and he's fading toward the green. I just know. And if he's doing it too fast, that's irrelevant. I'm playing, looking, and I'm listening. And I, you know, when he starts going, whether I like it or not, I gotta go. You know, or else I end up destroying the piece, trying to be stubborn. You know, and you can't do that. That's why it's this group kind of thing going. But the structure's still there. The whole thing is still going. I mean, that's why we like doing it. It's so that you can get very, very excited about it. And the biggest thing is we like taking a piece we perform one way, and all of a sudden we just rip it out and do it differently. Because, you know, that was enough doing that way. We gotta find something else out about it. You know, more information. What I do is like, in essence, you know, like all my training and things has been visual. And I've had some, I've taken some electronic music courses and some composition courses in music, but not that extensively like in, like in painting. Um, and what you do is by having three people around or four people, whatever the group number of the people in the group who have come with a different kind of training, uh, you get a different point of view about what you're doing. And you tend not to get carried away in what I call flighting off in your own head. You keep being brought back all the time. And I find that very interesting and challenging. Um, at the same time, you get more confident. You learn a lot. My musicians teach me a lot. I mean, they're there for a reason. I just don't have anyone in my group. I go through a lot of musicians. Why don't you do? Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, like, I, 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 had, one I had one fantastic percussionist. He went crazy. Ow! wouldn't tell him exactly what to do. He couldn't deal with it. I said, well, I want a sound. He said, well, tell me how to do the sound. I says, you got to do it, man. I made the painting, make the sound. He says, no, you got to tell me what to do. He says, I don't know what to do, man. So I can play anything you lay out. I said, well, you got to write it, baby. He says, no. Bye-bye. So they put him away. <laughs> no, I mean, he's fine. I mean, he plays with the floor off your orchestra. He does all kinds of things. But it's all written out. Instead of painted out, yeah. <laughs> and like, I, I don't necessarily, you know, and for my particular, in my kind of group situation, you can't be afraid of the unknown. That sounds okay. Okay, yeah, that's it. We're fine. And we keep trying and trying things and it doesn't work. And I tape record everything. And we do things, play and it's awful. Everybody leaves feeling terrible. I get called in the middle of the night, man, you know, I got an idea for that. So and so, so and so. Next rehearsal, we'll go in and we try it. And it goes on and on. All of a sudden, things start happening. And after a while, we found a number of pieces. We get them to a certain point, perform them. And then we start seeing this settling thing starts happening. That after a while, without knowing it, we all start doing things. And what it is is that there is enough time that we can think about the piece, understand the piece, and try more and more and more variations. And it starts really working itself out. So we have what we do call the piece a settling time. And some are faster and some are slower. And it just depends on the piece and depends on... And the more we rehearse and work together, I mean, the better it gets. We're going through pieces a lot faster now. And that's one reason why I hustle and I try to end up getting concerts because the more concerts I get, the more work I keep from them, then the easier it becomes. It's a strange thing. But I, you know, I really like it. It's like lots of fun. It keeps me nuts a lot of the time, but you know. 
that's the way I prefer it anyway. Go ahead. Can you hear the rest of it? Bob's not too loud, is he? You are teaching now. What do you teach? Are you involved with your students in? Is that loaded? What do you teach? No, 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 I teach printmaking primarily, but uh. Do you involve these kinds of concepts? In your I used to, uh, and uh, I've since stopped. Uh, I use music. Depends. It goes. I've been teaching 13, 14 years, and I uh, I get bored very quickly with. I'm always looking for new ways, new methods. I mean, uh, I mean, you're sitting right there now are a lot different from the people who would be sitting there six years ago. And so, uh, as times change in teaching, things have to change. So, uh, at times I incorporate music, and times I, and um, one semester I did some things with some dance, and that got awful in the printmaking studio. It's very dangerous, but uh, but it was fun. And uh, no, it, it 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 varies. But the one thing that I teach now that has infiltrated everything is, uh, I think, because of the times. I started teaching a course four years ago. It's been it's really developed now. It's called the Art Career Workshop, and it's basically it's a survival course. And it's a course where um, the idea is to give the young artist the f uh, foundation for survival and information. And I give information. I try not to, uh, say, give attitudes about it, even though I do, and try to keep it as flat, what I call as flat as possible. But I try to uh, make it possible that someone does have the drive, does have, does have the interest, that they can, uh, you know, survive. And uh, and I think it's needed because I think you know teaching is dead. I mean, the great patron of the '60s is overloaded right now, and it's like very little going around. There's a little bit, you know, there's other things around like one percent art and and uh, things like that. So. What I do in this course, for example, I teach people how to uh, teach people how to photograph their work, uh, how to write resumes, how to write grant proposals, how to find a gallery, um, how to make sure the gallery's doing the right thing. Like teach someone really about a gallery business in terms of writing news releases, brochures, um, you know, how to sell work. All the students in this class have to give at least one sales presentation during the semester and they take the course, uh, which they end up hating, but then when, when the word gets out, two or three people are selling work and everybody's out trying, you know. And uh, I have real estate people come in and tell them about how to buy a piece of property and, and how to sign leases and non-leases. Lawyers come in talking about um, uh, how to do income tax. Uh, we spend a lot of time on how to design space. Uh, for example, like if you got to, you know, you can't, produce work in a closet. But if you got a closet, we'll figure out how to design it so you can paint it. Well, anyway, that's, that's my main baby. That's the one I push, because that's for real. And uh, they got a plenty of, there are a lot of other instructors that Tyler give all the other stuff. And uh, it's my way of being honest, trying to be honest about it, that's all. Interesting thing is a bunch of people says, oh, you're doing things so new and stuff like that. It's not. I mean, uh, Satie played a Miro painting in 1908. I mean, Miro didn't do it as a score, but I mean, the whole, the whole concept. Uh, Historically, John, do you think there's a... Is there some point in history where this became the, the, f relating um, audio or aural things to painting historically, like uh, since 1850, or 
Have you ever thought about it in a historical context? You just, well, think, told, you just said 1908. Yeah, well, I think in historic, I think that in France around the turn of the century is really when a lot of the groundwork was laid, a lot of the ideas were laid. At this point, Eric Satie was, uh, for example, um, doing a lot of work or, and uh, being influenced somewhat by the Cubists. And since he was one of the first composers, they would try to uh, literally as soon as possible state the entire composition in almost a, at one and uh, two or three notes, and then just more repetition and variations of it, more like the Cubists would do six, seven, eight views of a head at one shot. Um, his interest was there, and then Satie, of course, was the first one to come up with the idea of furniture music, which is our now day Muzak, kinds of things like that. And he worked a lot to, they were doing a lot with, uh, you know, doing operas and, um, you know, really the first really visual happenings. Well, interesting enough, it's that uh, I've had a much stronger response in Europe than here. It's just sort of, it's sort of people, they say, yeah, we knew it was coming. <laughs> a yeah, couple of Europeans are bugged that it's, that an American's doing it. <laughs> but but uh, seriously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Do you intend your watercolors to be figurative? Because when I look up there, I see all sorts of extremely figurative elements. Uh, you mean human? Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let's put it this way. I put, people tell me they see all kinds of things like you say. And I say, that's wonderful. I'm glad, you know, and I'm glad you have an experience. It's fine. I mean, the fact that I intended it or didn't intend it is, I think, is ir irrelevant in a sense because you're having an experience, and that's the most important thing. Um, to me, what I do is put marks and things down and attempt to order them as well as I possibly can. And if I can do that, then I've been really successful. And um, that's like, it's, to me, it's like um, being so selfish and so personal that I can become universal. And so that's what, you know, in a sense, I try to do. But oh no, yeah, they all, they pick up their landscapes, all kinds of things, and nothing at the same time. There's a thing called the School Art League that I started in art. And Philadelphia uh, used to be, it's come down now a little bit since, you know, Frank has been in. We're getting rid of him finally, though. But, uh, uh, that's the mayor of Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo. Um, they had a thing called a school art league that there were 18 centers. And on like when I was in sixth grade, I could go on Saturday mornings. I went to art school. And there were high school instructors, college instructors who taught these classes. And by the time I was in 11th grade, I had uh, I'd done a five-foot figure, you know, and cast it. I'd done stone carving, wood carving. And um, this is where, for me, where it all began. Because I, I got bugged with sculpture when I was in school. And I was ceramics and printmaking split. And then really what pushed it to prints here altogether was that I was still split. I went to Tamron. I had a chance to go to Alfred or to go to Tamron. I took the lecture to go to Tamron. And I learned how to make prints. And I finished there. And I went to graduate school here. And for the first year, I was a split major. And the old Wendell Bozo was here. And he said, you can't split those two. And, uh, and I says, okay, I'll take a double major then. And so I was can double major. And after blowing up a number of kilns, I decided to stay with prints. <laughs> <laughs> you and, couldn't hurt anything in print Yeah, right. I used to, yeah. I used to blow the big pig. That's what we used to call it. <laughs> Some days I get, I was in Paris for six weeks, and some days, you know, man, I'm up, you know, up things, and certain things demand certain things, you know, your feelings about them. I, uh, this is a piece here based on uh, changing uh, parent quality of silence in a room. It's a thing based on whereby um, I want to create sounds where I do a long, continuous sound and make it fade from very quiet to loud to quiet again slowly, then like being very loud and cutting it off abruptly and back and forth. Because if we do that, um, 
the audience in the room reacts to the sound. Like we can, I can make an audience get very quiet by talking lower and lower and lower, but doing very slowly. Or we talking very loud. It's a, the sound. So it's just ideas like that. This, this was just this is one of about eight or nine drawings based on something like that. So, but the color thing is just. I mean, one day I'm in one thing, and another day I'm in, you know, that's of color. My saxophone player, he hasn't been with me that long, has been really freaking out. He goes to all the museums now and stuff that he never used to go before. So he's just turned on. And play in front of painting. No, well, I mean, he was, in, he was in Gene Pizzuto's office rehearsing the other day, and he says, man, I did some fine things on his. You'll get some of his. <laughs> he said, oh, he said, I could really do. He said, you know. And, um... Well, interestingly enough is that uh, um, he has a jazz group of his own that he performs with a lot, and he also performs with a funk rock group, too. And uh, he's been telling me that since he's been playing with me, uh, you know, his playing has been really changing a lot, especially, you know, in his solos and his creative kinds of things, because the drawings and the watercolors don't know any of the rules about composition and stuff. So he does things n now that he wouldn't normally do before that are perfectly valid, but because, you know, it just wasn't the thing to do or not to do. No one said not to do it, but it wasn't the thing to do, you know, and so. So I, you have, I, I'm inferring from that that you have no formal training in music composition. Right. Uh-huh. My training is like 900 records and searching for structure. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had a little, yeah, I've had some. This is like a piece based on uh, my uh, percussionist last night. You know, he had some glass chimes and stuff. And I've been trying to get him to work on a piece where we put contact mics and only play like real lightly with pins to glass chimes and stuff. <laughs> I am taking piano lessons. I've been taking piano lessons for a while. And I, you know, I can play um, not a lot of things, but the things that I do know, but I walk away from it. When I take piano lessons, I want a certain kind of thing. Want to have to play the right. No, but it's sort of, uh, you start, there's certain kinds of things they make you practice and do things that end up getting in the way. And at one point, this, the sound started changing. It was, it was something started happening. And it's because I was picking up all these rules and doing all this stuff, and I just said, hey, this has got to stop. <laughs> and I just, you know, just cut it out. I can make it so sweet, I can run you out the door. No problem. <laughs> On cue. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you people, if you, if you had to go to a class or something, we, we have actually run overtime, and... Uh, I'm going to try to give John a reprieve now. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you very much, John.